Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to start our discussion of neural networks. We are going to start it by introducing perceptrons. Now, perceptrons are a different kind of model than the ones that we have seen already. So we saw naive Bayes and logistic regression so far in this course. And um, both of these models are probability driven. So we first calculate the probability, either the joint probability of P of X comma Y or the conditional probability directly using the logit function as we did for logistic regression p of y given x in this video we are going to introduce perceptrons which are error driven as opposed to calculating probabilities and using the probabilities to make our prediction we are going to calculate the error and minimize the error to come up with our final prediction. Neural networks derive their inspiration from humans, as you may have heard. Humans have a very low, very, very fast neuron switching time. And there are lots of neurons in our body that actually carry all these messages. And the neurons are all connected and they form a path through our entire body. And that works really well because we can learn from very few examples and we also can perform tasks such as recognition, uh, motor driven tasks such as driving, walking, uh, pretty much with so much ease as if um, we don't have to put a lot of effort. So that same architecture is replicated in a neural network where we are first going to study the building block of this architecture which is nothing but the perceptron and then we'll see how we can use perceptron or other building blocks to construct big neural network architectures which are capable of doing complex tasks such as even self-driving cars have these uh, extensible and complex neural network architectures. So properties of neural networks, they work similar to humans, they borrow from humans, many neuron like threshold switching units, small um, computational units, very, uh, they only care about uh, simple computation, but they, we have so many of them in number, and then there are interconnections between them allowing for efficient transfer of information. They allow for highly parallel distributed process, as you will see in the course of um, this topic. And um, we have to learn the weights of these interconnections, which are nothing but the parameters of a neural network model. We have these units and the weights between them for the connections and the weights are what are learned at training time at test time a learned neural network with the weights are used to make the predictions so our simplest neural network is a perceptron for a perceptron we have um, a setup that is linear so it's a linear unit and this is something we have seen already in logistic regression where we have a weighted sum of the different features. Now xi is the ith feature and wi is the weight of the ith feature, how important ith feature xi is given by wi. And we have a sum of this, sum of weighted features. So that is what is computed inside this unit, the linear unit here, this unit that computes this sum. 
so what all do we need for this we need a bunch of features which are coming in through these nodes and they are multiplied with their corresponding weights w1 through wn and the weights are indicated on the edges like we um, discussed when we were introducing neural networks the weights are the parameters and they are the strength of the edges so oftentimes you will see that they are indicated on the edges so that's why w1 is over this edge here and there is also w0 which is like a constant it's called the bias term And uh, since this is a line equation, let's say if you have any line equation, which is given by y equal to mx plus c, the c is nothing but the y-intercept, right? The distance from the origin on the y-axis is given by c. And similarly, you have for an n-dimensional line that you have here, you have w0 x0 is the intercept is that is what the bias term gives you and this does not really capture any feature that's why x0 is initialized to 1 and this constant helps you give some variety to the line so that it does not always pass through the origin if you just have all these and you plot it across these n dimensions it is going to pass through the origin and this is going to prevent that the w0 term and it's going to add some capability to the line and that's why we have it and after you compute this wixi then you pass that on to a sine unit a sine unit then determines if this sum that you just calculated is greater than zero if it is greater than zero, then your output is one. If it is not greater than zero, then your output is minus one. And you can see here that we have moved away from zero for the negative class and one for the positive class. We now indicate one for the positive class and minus one for the negative class. And that is the difference between probability-based models and error-driven models. We want to calculate the error, so we are clearly distinguishing between having the same amount of error for each misprediction, right? So we need to have that. That's why we have 1 and minus 1 here. Sometimes we use a vector notation. That's why we often refer to feature as feature vector features as feature vector and w vector as the weight vector and again we have the same inequality here greater than zero and if it's greater than zero it's one otherwise it's minus one that's what is your prediction o of x vector would give you your prediction just going over linear classifiers again our inputs are the values for the different features and these are similar to what we saw in the naive base example and the decision tree example outlook temperature wind conditions those are the features and sunny temperature is uh, warm and um, uh, wind is strong those are the values of these features so our inputs to this perceptron are going to be the values of the features 
And now each feature we know has a weight. And the sum we call the activation function. And the activation is positive, then the output class is positive. And this is calculated using a sine function. So the perceptron is a combination of the activation and the sign. Now let's take a small example. Let's take the spam ham example again where spam is positive and ham is the negative class. Now we have number of occurrences of each word to be the value of the feature and the feature itself is that word. So number of occurrences of free, occurrences of money and then we have the bias. We have only two words free and money. Let's say in X in the document we have free equal to one, money equal to one and bias term the value of x is 1. Let's say we have these numbers. And let's say we have initialized weights to be minus 3 for the bias, 4 for free and 2 for money. Now, to calculate this, we take a weighted sum. So we have minus 3 times 1, 4 this is corresponding to the bias term. So this is the value of bias. This is the weight of bias. Similarly, value of feature free and weight. Similarly. And then we finally calculate the value of w dot x that comes out to be 3. Now, because it's greater than 0, our prediction is spam. So that's how we predict. Once we have the weights, we use the weights, and then we calculate the value. And if it is greater than 0, we call it the positive class. If it is less than zero we call less than or equal to zero we call it the negative class we predict the negative class right so this is when we have the weights now just look at the decision surface of a perceptron before we go on to see how to learn the weights of this model the perceptron's decision surface is linear for two features, we know it's going to look like this, right, a simple line. And then otherwise, it's going to be a n-dimensional hyperplane, a plane across the n dimensions. So it's going to be linear and it can represent some simple useful functions. For example, and is a function, Boolean function, which the perceptron can represent. And a very popular example that is given to highlight some of the drawbacks of a very simple neural network model, that is the perceptron, is the XR function. So the XR function is given on the right. So we have 2 plus here on the opposite quadrants. And again, we have two minuses on the other two quadrants. And you can just intuitively look at this and say that a line cannot possibly separate them, right? Because you have to at least leave one of the plus or the minus on one side. So for example, you will draw a line like this, like this, like this right none of these lines can possibly separate 
all plus to, the, to one side and all minus to another side. It's just not possible. And such models, sorry, such data are called not linearly separable data. XR, this, the graph on the right, B, is not linearly separable. It's not linearly separable. Whereas the graph on the left, the data is linearly separable. So linearly separable is a very important concept in machine learning. And if your data is linearly separable, it's easy for you to find a good model to separate it because it has this natural separation already. And now you can easily understand that most of the data out there that in real world are not linearly separable, may not be linearly separable. That's why you need all these complex models which you keep reading about. So if life is all rosy and you have all data that is linearly separable, simple intuitive models can still give you great results because the model the data itself has this this good characteristic of linear separability so linearly separable is nothing but to define it formally if you can separate the points with the help of a linear surface a line is a linear surface if we have only two features right and we're plotting them so you have very the simplest form of a surface is a linear surface. With a linear surface, with a plane, if we have three-dimensional data and n-dimensional hyperplane, if we have n dimensions. And if you have data points which can be separated using a linear surface, then the data is called linearly separable. And that's a quality that you want to look out for the data and if the if your data has that quality, it's easy for you to model and pick the right models. You don't need something really complex for this data. And remember again, overfitting and other stuff that we have discussed so far in this course. For example, for the graph on the left, if you construct a model which is like this, maybe, this is really overfitting because it's an overkill for this, this data which is already linearly separable. In the next video, we will see how to learn the weights of the perceptron.